you know, this, this two chapters that are coming up, chapter two and chapter three. And so we're going to be uh, studying the history. Why does, so the, the big question is why should we even study architecture history? You know, I don't know if you are an architect, a history person. I don't know if you like history. I don't know if you feel like, you know, it's good or not. But you know, if you're studying architecture, why do we even care about history? That's the big question that we have to sort of understand before we go into this next two uh, chapters. And number one, you know, is, um, is history helps understand the, the basic um, landscape. It helps us to really, you know, see what's going on around us. And by that, it gives us an appreciation of our surroundings. So even if, you, if you're going to study architecture in the future, if you want to work as an architect or in construction or engineer or something related to architecture, uh, this is definitely going to be helpful. But even if you're going to go into nursing or any other profession, uh, studying architecture, the history of architecture gives you an appreciation for what's surrounding. That's sort of when I teach the history class, that's basically what I tell them. You know, uh, because a lot of the students during the history class, they're, they, they're not architecture majors, they're, that's not their focus. And I say just appreciating architecture will definitely change the way you live, the way you look at life, the way you look at your surroundings, the way you really get to appreciate, you know, a big part of where we live, you know. And so, uh, but, uh, but in regards to those of us who, you know, are studying architecture, th the main reasons that it helps us is it allows for a real compreh comprehension of, of the relationship and the function of, of architecture. We get to understand, you know, the, the philosophies and the ideas that they use, the technologies that they were using, and that kind of helps us understand um, how we can use that in our architecture itself. So in essence, we look at the design of space and place through the work and writings of architects. And in order to move forward, it's imperative, imperative to first understand what's behind us. So it's this idea of, you know, we want to create something today, but, you know, most likely there's something done last week or a hundred years ago that that is probably going to look very similar or at least you can get inspiration from or you can learn from them as to what they've done so basically this is going to be summarized to this word precedence so when we if you are able if you ever study architecture or if you ever do practice architecture one of one of the ways that you start um in architecture is by this by doing precedence so precedence basically is asking yourself, has this been done before? Uh, uh, has this been done before? I'm just going to do before. And, and it's, it's this idea of you don't have to, don't reinvent the wheel. You know, if it works, it works. Don't, you don't have to create something new that's already there. And, and so, um, so yeah, basically you're asking your, yourself the question, was this done before? And so an example that, you know, I, I give right now, but you can do anything. It's let's say you're doing a stadium. You're working for this company to tell you, hey, I want to do this 20,000 person stadium. It's a football stadium um, or a soccer stadium for the Olympics or whatever. And so what do you do? You know, you start looking into example, you know, what, what do, you know, you, you have an idea. I want to do a circular stadium. So you start looking into other stadiums from other countries, from other times, and you start looking at other, you know, kind of central circular plan type, uh, you know, stadiums. If you want it to be uncovered, you know, you start looking at, uh, you start refining your search. And, and, but then you could even go, and then we can even go back to, you know, the Colosseum. I know some of you presented the Colosseum as your architectural, you know, but in, in a way it looks, very, if you look at this and this, you can definitely see a resemblance. You know, something done, you know, uh, many, many, many years ago and something done, uh, I think this is actually built. I'm not sure if it's a rendering of it's built. Um, but you can see the, the, the similarities. You can see maybe even the inspiration. So when I will ask you to design something in this class, and so let's say I ask you to design a, you know, a school, or house or whatever I ask you to design, start just designing, you know, okay, one this is, you know, 
if, if the first step, again, it's we talked about it last week, is this idea of knowledge, this idea of epistemy, and this idea of obtaining knowledge and understanding what you're going to do. So you, you start understand, studying the land, you start understanding what you want to do, but one of the things that you also, the way you also study that is by going back into the past and studying, you know, other examples that have been done and that you sort of like. So present stu studies is a very important part of architecture. So hopefully that helps. Um, uh, so this is another example. Uh, so this is Leonardo da Vinci and da Vinci, he did this uh, Vitruvius Man. I don't know if you've seen it before, I'm pretty sure you have. It's like pretty common and, you know, and, and popular culture, uh, even if many don't know what it means exactly, but you know, you, you see it everywhere in shirts and stuff. Uh, but Leonardo da Vinci, he didn't really actually create it. He's actually replying to something that Vitruvius did. So it's actually, he saw Vitruvius doing this and he was like, let me do my own version. And then Le Corbusier later on, which is a sort of a modern tech, looked at, looked at what da Vinci did and said, hey, you know, I'm gonna do my own version called the Modular Man. So again, I won't explain this too much, um, but uh, I just want to, wanted to see how the architects are looking into what others have been doing and sort of building from it. Another example is, uh, uh, Daniel mentioned right now, uh, Frank, Lloyd, um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and the Falling Water. And so Frank Lloyd Wright was someone that was inspired by Japanese architecture. He went to Japan many times. He has buildings over there. And so this is a Japanese home. This is uh, one that was designed by Frank Lowe Wright. And you can start seeing a lot of the similarities or the influence and or a lot of the things that, you know, he got inspiration from. So it's this idea of, of him, you know, going into the past, learning from the past and bringing into his design. So history is very, very important when it comes to architecture. So now I'm actually gonna start with the lecture, but before that, any questions, are we good? I think we're gonna get a, a thumbs up or just something to know. I didn't, no still questions. there. Uh, okay, so, um, all right, so now we start, let's, so this chapter's, again, um, there's a full course on this, so this class is the whole idea is not to focus on history. So uh, take the history classes, please. It'll it'll give you a full version of this. Uh, but yeah, basically, you know, let's go back into this architecture, how it evolved. So basically, there's a video that I've already uploaded uh, on Blackboard. I don't know if anyone has seen it, but it's sort of you know I explain mainly this part in in that video. So. So, so watch both videos that kind of complement each other. Uh, but basically we start, you know, we start going from this, you know, uh, Paleolithic era, which was this era that, you know, people didn't have permanent residences, you know, so they, they were nomads. So they were, you know, wherever the food was, that's where they were. So in case, you know, whatever animal they were hunting moved, they moved too. So they, so they were constantly moving. They never had permanent shelter. And so one of the early uh, things that we, is, we see caves, you know, we see drawings of caves. So we get the idea that they were hunting. Uh, but the earliest dwellings were something like this, you know, so using bones of animals or using some sort of things for, for very, um, not very protective things, uh, uh, very temporary structures that will allow them to, you know, sleep and then be able to pick it up and go and build it somewhere else. And also uh, then we, and throughout the same time, we sort of start seeing how they start utilizing um, big stones to sort of, you know, building something. They, at this time, which is called the megaliths, megaliths just mean like huge, heavy rocks. And so they start building this sort of the Stonehenge and we'll see others right now. But uh, right now it's not really uh, building, but we start seeing they start to use stones to build permanent structures, which becomes important. Again, then they start building, then they go into more sedent uh, sedentary uh, way of living. So now they're like, hey, let's um, 
we can actually, we don't have to keep moving. What about if we start planting? What if we start gardening? What if we plant uh, plan our crops and, you know, we, we don't have to move? So they started doing that. And so here in Egypt, you know, there's this river. And so uh, they started, you know, building or, you know, building houses near the, the water. So the water will provide water for them, but also provide water for, you know, for the crops. And again, similar things start happening. We start seeing a more uh, culture that becomes, um, instead of moving around, now they're able to, to uh, stay in place. And so, yeah, so the, the beginning of times is called the you know, prehistoric time is the Stone Age. And so it's very easy to, to know that era because basically everything that you see will be huge stones. So uh, this, the most famous is this one, which is called Stonehenge. And so uh, again, in the video that I did previously, you'll, I'll explain a little bit more. But you know, the big thing, uh, there's a lot of videos that talk about the mystery of Stonehenge. Like, what is it? You know, how did it happen? And so, but the big thing is that, that they're bringing these huge, heavy stones that weigh tons. And how are they moving them? How are they transporting them? But one of the big things that we start to see here that I want you to see is that um, there's this idea that they're beginning to create this idea of column and a beam, you know, this idea of uh, this will basically create the foundation for everything that's going to be built, you know, new thing going up and something uh, sort of holding it up and then you kind of keep going. And uh, I'm pretty sure when you've played with Legos, you've done this yourselves. That's sort of like an instinct that we have to put two things together and something on top and we find that uh, stability. So that's something that starts happening here and later on gets developed further. So men here just means standing stone. This one just don't mean, just means uh, basically uh, stone laying down horizontally. Uh, chroma leg basically is the same thing as a dolmen, which is more, I guess. Uh, tumulus is a tomb. So um, so inside there's dead bone, things like that, and light just really comes in. And I'll, I'll explain that in the other video. Uh, but the big thing, again, uh, people didn't have permanent dwellings. That's the big thing that we need to understand. They had caves. They had temporary shelters, they had huts, they had things that, you know, uh, were not really, um, and everything really uh, was surrounding fire. Uh, that's also a big thing that, that you'll see. And later on, when we design houses, uh, you know, it's even modern homes, uh, it's sort of usually, you know, it was originally designed to be around fire. When they had like the fireplace and things like this. Nowadays, it's not that common since we have AC or heaters. But even before, you know, even when they were had uh, modern houses, they, it was still everything surrounding fire. So, so they go from temporary things to, to really uh, having something more permanent. And here's a video that I won't show, but um, it's in your links. So there's a folder called video links. And so everything that, that I say, hey, here's a video. I'm not going to show it, but it's there, and I encourage you to go see it. Uh, so Kata uh, Lahoy, it's basically this, you know, transitioning from nomads to, hey, let's create something here. You see the water. Let's create a civilization next to the water. And so they build these communities. And, um, and again, I won't explain too much. There's a video that you can see that, but I just want to know that, you know, there's communities starting to build. I already talked about this. I guess this should have been before. So this is just some paint, uh, cave paintings uh, to help you understand the beginning, you know, that it, people were really um, hunters, basically. And, and, and so, and, but it's, uh, but it's um, very interesting to see those paintings, you know, knowing that they are, you know, thousands of years old. And uh, so, yeah, so then we start going into, again, more transitioning into the third millennium. You start seeing something more uh, permanent. Uh, you start seeing something that they start building high. They start really focusing on creating temples. They start really focusing. So now that you have a community, right, we've talked about they're not, now they're not moving from place to place. Now they've figured out how to stay in one place. 
So now they, they need things. Uh, they, they, they have their living area, but now they're starting to play around with other things. What, uh, do I need a school? Do I need a, a temple? Do I need a, a, a you know a medical section? You know, do I need a hospital? So now they start building uh, buildings for different functions. So again, a huge drastic change because before they're not going to build a uh, you know a, a big huge temple if they're going to be moving in three weeks. Uh, but now that they're going to be living. They're like, okay, now we can do things like this. And so these are. Uh, what we call the, you know, the cigarettes, which I think I had another picture, but I uh, know. Basically, you know, it has the ziggurat, and it's, uh, I'll talk about that in the other video, and and so there, there's some parts of it, so if you see here, a lot of, most of this is sort of uh, now redrawn to, to what we think it might have looked. A lot of has already um, disappeared. Um, but basically, you know, it's it's nice to see that this was before uh, many of the more modern temples that we see. And again, this this sort of idea of of temples starts happening in around in different countries as well. Uh, here's a video again that I said, and here in the bottom is where I say this is the video links that you can look at. And as I mentioned, they are already in your blackboard, the video that I recommend. And then we go into ancient Egypt. And um, throughout this time, you're going to start seeing that how are they expressing themselves. So OK, so we go from not having a permanent dwelling. So you didn't really care how your house looked. Then we start into like, OK, we have permanent places. Let's build temples. Let's build things. Then we go into, OK, if we're going to build something, let's make it nice. You know, so now the idea of expression begins to arise. So that's something huge. Again, a big, 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 uh, big, uh, important change, uh, the idea of expression. And so um, so now we start to really and again, the expression even in, in even in the megaliths, uh, I think something happened. Um, uh, so there was expression even in the in the previous in all of the different eras, but um, the expression it starts to become even more and um, clearer for everyone. I'm trying to load this the presentation one more time. There you are. So uh, so the pyramids they uh, and um, uh, again I explain a little bit in the other video, which is simply is a tombs. Basically, it's a place for uh, as the pharaohs, and the pharaohs were basically thought uh, to be gods, uh, deity. Uh, they were buried here, and they were buried down, you know, below, uh, into this sort of chamber-like. And, and so again, they start thinking not only of expression, but they start thinking of the afterlife. They start thinking of what happens after. Uh, there's three periods: old, middle, and new kingdom. Mostly, everything that we see happens in these two. The middle is a little, you know, slow, um, but it's still, I mean, there's still things that happen. Uh, a little, uh, uh, a type of dwelling, again, we'll, we'll be seeing uh, dwellings throughout this whole uh, history. We'll be comparing them, but again, you start seeing, you know, the way that um, the ideal things that they need, uh, such as where to sleep, the fire, um, you know, how, so uh, how do they keep shade and things like this? So, which also it's it's good to see this when compare it to um, the Chantelay hook, which I mentioned before. And, and so here again, uh, they have a clear view, or they're kind of close to the pyramids. So again, they're being built close to that. Now we get to ancient Greece, and ancient Greece is if you go into any Egyptian. Um, uh, architecture, you're going to see the buildings are very, they're basically, if this is a stone, uh, it basically is going to seem like the stone and then this is a sculpture. So basically it seems like the, the, the sculpture is trapped in the stone. Basically what it's trying to say is that it seems almost that it's static. 
it feels like it's not moving. It feels very frozen in time. But then we get into Greece and we see how they've they kind of liberated the stone. So you see this structure, this sort of like female uh, column types. And they're basically now they're just freestanding. You know, you don't really know where, if it was a stone or, you know, it's just simply see it. And so they kind of elevated the style of beauty. So, so a lot of people say that this is a moment where, you know, expressionism changed into becoming something that was more, you know, artistic and more, uh, really caring about the beauty. So uh, Egyptians, many people believe that it, it was more representational rather than trying to um, reach beauty. You know, it was more about portraying their gods, portraying their information. You know, it was more informational. And But the Greek, it was more artistic. It was more about uh, they had this idea of perfect beauty, of you know, bringing something into life. And, and so that's why uh, Greece really inspired most of the common architecture that we have nowadays, because of that idea of you know searching for the right proportion, searching for this idea of beauty. So uh, in the other lecture, I, I mentioned a couple of these temples, and but I just want you to you know notice um, uh, you know the idea of again temples starting to arise, creating a community. And, and so this is actually, if this is the, the this temple is actually kind of here at this elevated um, sort of mountain type. And so when you're in the city in the bottom, you can always see this huge temple um, to, to, you know, to the goddess. And, and so again, they're, they're creating a community and now they're permanent dwellings, but not only permanent dwellings, uh, but now they're not just giving you information through architecture. Now they're elevating it to beauty. And so the again, I mentioned in this in the in the lecture, but this is the uh, Caryatids, and basically there is this there's this story. Those of you who like Greek mythology, I think people some of you mentioned that in previous lectures and presentations. And there's this idea of um, that something bad happened to these women. And through war, kind of, and they're sort of represented here as a sort of like honoring them. And they start, you know, now they they don't just need temples and places to for leisure. So they create this this uh, theater of uh, of Delphi, and it's sort of for plays, sort of for you know communication for for different things. So they create this amphitheater, which is an amphitheater. It's basically you know an outdoor theater. And uh, there is one, there's, I think there's some, there's several here in the valley, actually, if you want to go, I think it's one of Tres Lagos, I don't know if you've ever been, but, uh, but basically, you know, people would go here and they would have this, uh, they would here see this place, and what's really interesting, and it'll change later on, is that they basically use this whole, this was their background, so they kind of designed this as a way that this is the this is part of the architecture, as when you're sitting here, you can see that and you can feel that it's part of it. So so that was a big big uh, um, an, a, another big part of this change or this moment in architecture where we start seeing architecture and nature sort of meeting, communicating, and saying you know they can they can talk to each other. Uh, we still are in ancient Greece, some videos for you, more temples. Uh, and so one of the things I do want to talk about is this idea of, of different styles of temples, because again, it'll come up over and over in the next chapters, is um, uh, just basically the way it, uh, the reason why this is important is because you start getting this idea of facade. And facade is the idea of what's the face. So if I would ask you, you know, which is the facade? What is the face of this building? Which one would you say? Um, you know, some would say it's this, some would say it's this, some would say it's this. But I mean, the right answer or the one people, you know, I guess historians assume is the facade is this one, mainly because this is entrance. And so you go into this pronoun, which is this sort of lobby sort of 
uh, entrance way, and then you get into this nail cellar, which is uh, this altar place. Is this place where you will have uh, usually a uh, goddess or god an altar, and you would come in and you would you know give your your um, offering or some you know your prayer or something, and so. Um, and but then if we look into this one, uh, there's sort of entrance here and entrance here. This one does not look. You get into the now into the the cella or you know the altar place, so it does give you this sort of porch area that you can just still be covered. Uh, the circles represent columns, so that's another thing that we want to start learning. We want to start learning how to read a plan. So learning what the lines mean, what's, what the things mean. So in this case, the circles are columns. Uh, so these are usually walls. And when you see things like this, usually openings. And so uh, an entrance or things like that. Uh, these are usually steps. So you kind of see the steps coming up. And, and so again, but now we get into this, this one, which is like a circle. So then again, which is a facade. And I mean, the right answer, I guess, is all of them are. This is the main entrance, so I guess this area is the facade, but at the same time, all of them most likely look identical, you know. So again, you start seeing this uh, this idea, and then this one becomes, uh, um, uh, you know, from a distance, this one, you don't really know which one is the facade. And, you know, the columns here are freestanding, and here the columns are sort of in the wall. So those are other things that you start seeing. So you start seeing how uh, the idea of a facade, the idea of where you enter, the idea of what people want to see, the idea of, of, of traveling into a, a building starts to uh, begin. You start seeing how, you know, what is entrance, you know, uh, this one they added a sort of like a back room. So this is basically, it's, if you Google this, it'll give you different answers because historians are not 100% sure because there's so many different uh, responses to this. Um, basically, this one is, is some say that, you know, when it was full uh, of like, you know, offerings and gold and things, they were kind of stored here. And this is a place that no one can come in. It was, you know, basically protected. And uh, some say it was part of another prayer room. So it's different, different responses. Uh, but also another thing that's very important here is, which we'll, you know, you'll be doing assignments on, is the idea of, you know, columns. But not just because of columns, but because again, something called the, the, you know, the Greek order. So what's important about this is that they, they create something that now could be uh, duplicated or copied over and over again. And, and creating styles that now you could just design your house and say something. Can you add two uh, Dory columns? Can you add uh, this? Kind, you know, it, it became a way of of having a a common language, which before you know every architecture was basically you know what are you doing? Let's see, let's get creative. But now we have something that's um, that you can you know that you already have a language, a sort of style. So these are the three styles: Doric. Ionic and Corinthian. Uh, the main idea of these is Doric is, and you know, Vitruvius calls it manly. So you see, it's kind of big, strong. That's you know, seems it's a bit more uh, stronger uh, feeling, and it has a you know has no base. And the Ionic, again, Vitruvius mentions that it's a little bit more feminine, like so it's a bit more slender, more sleek. And it has this vol volumes at the top, and it has a base. The the Corinthian, which many people like the most, is usually it's there's again Greek mythology is pretty amazing, and it has all the different stories, and it's this idea of the story of this leaf that was kind of placed somewhere, and there over a rock, and this kind of leaf just started growing and covered this stone, and that's sort of how this leaf-like uh, uh, kind of capital started, you know, began. And so again, this became the three the three uh, common uh, orders that were, you can see them in almost every Greek building. And they each kind of had these different things, you know, uh, on the top. And so that also varied depending on the order that was being used. 
you know, and so now hopefully now you start seeing these columns and you're like now see which one, which now you hopefully go through all the uh, different temples and now you can see um, what columns are there. That could be a fun game for you. Uh, now we're moving into Persia. Uh, again, very similar, this idea of going up in vertical. We start seeing it now being used for construction. But again, it's just the same idea of columns starts to arise, but not following the Greek order, but following something else. Rome is, again, now the idea of we're talking, you know, they're moving from temporary dwellings to permanent dwellings, to communities, to cities. And Rome is that example of a city or basically a perfect city, a city that had it all. And when I say all is that despite of their, you know, lack in technological advancements, they were able to, you know, have a lot of things to make a city work properly. So here, you know, you see this, this is an aqueduct. So basically this provided drainage and water for many of the homes. And, and here they had sporting, and now they're going into, you know, sporting events. Uh, they had, you know, they had religious, they had, now they, they created a city that had not only things for worship or, you know, religion based, but they had things for, for entertainment. They had bathhouses, which is spas. They had, uh, uh, you know, sort of this um, places for leisure and entertainment. We see the Colosseum, which we talked about later on. And here it's interesting that uh, here's an example of how they learned from the past. So Romans saw the Greek and went, wow, they're really good. They create beautiful things, but we're better. We're stronger. You know, they Romans are very, uh, to a certain point, cocky because they are able to now get uh, concrete. So concrete, what uh, allowed them to do is, you know, in Greek, it was more stone based. And, but here, Rome had, was able to do this with concrete. So the, the good thing about concrete is that you don't have to bring huge rock. So the Greeks, you know, they have to bring this huge rock, bring it here, and then sort of, you know, build it. The, the Romans, they could just bring the ingredients of all the different ingredients, which can be tra transported very easily, mix it all together, you know, water and all these ingredients, and you get concrete which is actually not called concrete for them, but it's this type of concrete called um, um, pozzolana. So now they're able to build huge things wherever they want. So they are like, hey, this is a pretty far place. Well, let's take concrete there, you know, it's pretty easy. And before you had to sort of build where uh, near stones. And so, so they start building really high, really tall, uh, really strong and very heavy. And so here, if you see this, if you do a quick zoom in of every single arch, the arch, every single one of them has a different order. So one has Doric, and then another one has Ionic, and the other one's Corinthian. What they're trying to say is, hey, Greek, you guys are really good, but we're actually better. We can create one building with all of them into our architecture. We, this is how good we are. And what's really also interesting is that some of them are not even um, structural. They're not holding anything. They're just simply decorative. And so, so again, you start seeing how history starts into play, especially in, the, in, that, in those times. They start seeing what's happening near them, and they want to be better. It's, there's always this sort of competition. Uh, again, we start seeing this idea of temples, and we saw in the Greek temple, we have the, the freestanding columns, and then you had this the cella, which was this sort of the, the idea of the, temp, the altar inside, and you had one opening. And so again, you start seeing that again happening in Greece, the, in Rome, sorry, which this sort of columns, but now this one takes the idea of a temple and then creates something new. This is the Pantheon. Um, uh, and so now they create basically the same. We're gonna we see your Greek, uh, but we're gonna raise it a Roman. You know, combining this idea of circle and square into one. And and so uh, again, so the Romans were really seeing what they what the Greek did, 
but taking it up another level basically. And this is the aqueducts that we talked about. So the reason why the road were able to build uh, very, um, very long is because of this, because of the arches. So there's actually going to be a question in your uh, quiz that you will have. And one of those questions is, how did the Romans build so high? And it has to do with, uh, with great spans, has to do with the use of arches. And so, um, and here's another forum. This is how it, we believe it looked, and this is how it looks now. And if you ever go visit, this is full of cats first. I don't know why, but you just see cats running all over. And the forum is just basically, again, the idea of the city, what do they need, and so things like this. And so throughout this, uh, in this forum, they had what they call was the basilicas. And so later on, right now, maybe if you hear the word basilica, you think of a church, you know, something religious. But in this time, basilicas was just a meeting place, it was a place, you know, community to have meetings, have gatherings, maybe even sell things. Uh, it was not really related to church. Um, the reason why now basilicas are, you know, we associate it with is because, uh, again, we we get from history and we learn from it. And so people that when they started building the basilicas or the churches, they get God inspiration from the basilica. So they sort of built it in the same way, very, very, very similar style, uh, but now made it, uh, used it for other, another, a different function. Again, we see the arches that, uh, that are known for the uh, creating the big spans and creating light. Again, different types of residences. I think I mentioned this in the other lecture, but just you know, very quick. There's different. Um, um, this residence is if you were rich, you could have this layout. You have two two, two different courtyards, and uh, which is called you know the um, you have this sort of atrium house that they used to call them. And so, so yeah, this is if you were rich, you had a, a house like this, or even if you were even, you know, had more money, you had a villa. But most houses actually look like this, which is the Unsulai, which is basically apartment complexes. So if you see here, there's actually, this is the restroom, and some of these houses had a restroom. So if you ever need to use a restroom, you're on the fourth floor, you have to get out and come here. Um, so, and usually, I uh, don't know if that is a fire, but you sh most of these burned down or, you know, it was um, kind of got destroyed the time. This is sort of how it looks. But again, this is was the most common sort of type of, of dwellings. Um, I mentioned the, the restrooms. So they have baths that are public. Uh, so they have this Roman bath, which is basically a spa. But uh, but even if if you didn't have that, they have this. Um, they have Roman baths which are outside. So basically, it was a community event for some reason. They really you know they had this um, moment where they would just use the restroom outside and just talk and have meetings there, and then and just leave. It was a very community. Uh, centered place, so that's interesting, I guess. Uh, and the infrastructure, again, I've talked about, so the city, now that you're not just having a city, but now you need a way to make it happen, you know. So you have this sort of aqueduct uh, with the huge arches, uh, you have this this road, uh, they start building roads, there's space that is called Every, low, every road leads to Rome. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase, but it's this uh, idea that they build Rome as center and then you know every single city, every road would connect back to that, um, to Rome. And so that's where we kind of got that phrase. Clocum uh, Maxima, it's a sewer, it still exists, and it's still sort of being used in a way that they had the sewer system, they had water ducts, they had roads. Uh, some even some cities even had uh, here they had huge stones. I don't know if you can see it, but you had huge stones here. And what they would do is like once a week or ever so often, they would open this like sort of like dam, this sort of like water uh, uh, 
uh, this river that was, and they would bring the water and the water would come down. And the reason why is because they had horses. So when they had horses, the horses, you know, they would uh, make this very dirty um, through excrement and, you know, feces and all this. And so, um, and so they would bring the, open the water and they would clean the whole street. And, but they had this huge stones that I mentioned. And so if you wanted to cross from here, uh, if you want to cross from here to here, and it was cleaning time, it was, you know, water time, you could still cross by these huge stones that they had placed. So again, pretty ingenious. They started getting really smart. Uh, the Romans really, really uh, took it to a whole new level when it comes to building a city. Uh, so again, uh, this was the three orders that we've talked about. But the Romans, again, they're like, hey, we're pretty much we're better than everyone. So they added two more um, um, uh, orders. Uh, the composite is basically combining different things. They're saying, hey, we can mix and match. So um, so again, that's sort of the, the idea of history 